All right, recording started. We are live. Audio and video is up. Welcome back to Senior Seminar. I know we didn't meet uh, last week, uh, so let me do a, a couple. Uh, let me go through a couple of housekeeping items. So the math quiz, the FE exam quiz, the math quiz is graded. The solutions posted. Um, as you saw in the email, I didn't get a chance to upload a quiz, uh, the Geotech quiz last week, so um, I'm not going to hold anybody to that. What I'm going to do is um, I'll probably try and get that uploaded uh, as soon as possible. I'll, because we're, we're sort of winding down our FE review, I'm, I'm really just sort of interested that you do it sometime between now and the end of the semester, so I'll probably be pretty liberal with a due date on that. I just want to make sure that, that you do it. Um, uh, before I get into our uh, introduction and today, I have a, a few items I want to mention. One of them is in regards to uh, steel design for those of you that are interested in taking it. I know some of you have already had it, so this doesn't apply to you. But for those of you that are interested in taking it, um, I want to talk a little bit about the book. If you go to the course schedule, there is no textbook listed. Uh, for the course, and that is true. We we do not. I do not require you to buy a textbook, but you do need to purchase the steel. Um, the way that works is this: uh, if you were to purchase it on your own, it's it's pretty expensive. It's like you know, three hundred some odd bucks. Um, AISC grants uh, discount coupons to students that are registered uh, for the class. What happens is I, I as the professor, request them. Uh, and then AISC will grant them uh, as the semester gets, uh, as the semester date approaches. So if you're interested, I would go ahead and register for the class sooner rather than later. Once I get the coupon code, I will send that out uh, to everybody. It's something like, I think it's like 135, uh, and that's a, a lot better than, I think it's like 360 for uh, if you were to buy it on your own. Um, you don't need it for the first, um, it is. It is in the it is in the syllabus. Yes, it's just not listed on the course schedule, and and the reason is because the coupon code program through AISC they only grant it to the professor. They don't grant it to the bookstore. Um, so that that's something to keep. That that's that's why they do that. Um, but if you're interested in taking it, I would just register for it uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, two more announcements. One of them is in regards to capstone. Um, you, uh, so first off, you were going to have a really awesome professor. Um, now you're going to have a really crappy one. Um, this guy is horrible. He is a jerk. I mean, you all are, are in for a, a rough time. Um, <laughs> I'm yeah. just kidding. Actually, no, I'm not. No, uh, <laughs> no I, I'm going to be your, your uh, capstone professor next semester. Uh, as some of you are finding out, there's been some schedule conflicts uh, in the schedule. We're work. Uh, in fact, I think it's already live. We have added a second section of capstone. Uh, that's Monday, Wednesday, Friday at nine. That doesn't conflict with the statistics uh, section. Um, but uh, so long story short, anybody that has a conflict can register for that section as well. It's all going to be like one experience, so it doesn't really matter which section you register for. Um, but that'll that'll become clear as the semester progresses. But uh, but yeah, don't. Um, don't worry about about uh, so much any. <laughs> well, you can stick around at Marshall a little longer if you want. <laughs> um, uh, one final uh, uh, one final announcement, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Bryce. Um, I received a contact from Toyota uh, manufacturing the Toyota plant uh, in the region, and they're actually looking for environmental engineers. I think they're looking co-ops and interns, but I think they're looking to hire like yesterday. So if there's anybody that's interested in that, um, I know they're wanting a very quick turnaround. So if you're interested, just send me your resume. And, and if you're interested, I would do it, you know, like now, uh, and I'll get that moved uh, 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 up the pipeline. But if you're interested, just uh, just send me your resume. Okay, that's it. So, um, you know, we've been doing FE exam review for a while now. This is a senior seminar course for civil engineers, and there's larger issues than the than the uh, FE exam. And so um, we got together uh, as a department and discussed some, you know, some other topics that we thought that you should be aware of. And one really big buzzword in the world of civil engineering is this concept of sustainability. Um, the resident expert in the um, uh, the resident expert in the uh, 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 
in the department on sustainability is Dr. Bryce. And so he prepared a little presentation and an assignment for you this week. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bryce. You should have presentation controls. I'm going to mute my mic as you present, but if you have any issues, you let me know. Uh, with that, uh, thank you, Dr. Bryce, for uh, for for being to, to to talk to our class today. Uh, I look forward to it. The floor is yours. All right, I appreciate it, Dr. Mullinson. And and like he said, uh, uh, he'll be teaching your capstone next semester, which should make your life a little bit easier. Um, now, those that have had me in class before, which I think is every single person on this list, um, uh, knows that the homework I put up uh, will not take you a long time. Um, you know, that's something I'm known for is, is quick and easy homework. So, um, no, I, I kid. It's it's uh, it's really designed to have you explore concepts in sustainability. Um, when we talk about sustainability, really the idea here is, you know, what do we mean first? Um, how does it apply to your practice second? Um, and then how does it apply to decision making? Those, uh, which is a large portion on this list that are in my CE443 class know right now that, um, you know, I'm big into decision making. I'm big into how do we use our engineering designs and engineering analysis uh, to make decisions? Because in the transportation world, at least, that's a big piece of your job. So what I want for you to get out of this lecture today, or what I hope for you to get out of this lecture today, is a general understanding of what sustainability is. The last thing that I, I want for you all to do is, is um, run off and start talking about sustainability as if it is only uh, saving koala bears, right? That's part of it, um, but it's a, it's a much bigger, more holistic frame. Um, I want you to be able to describe the three basic components of sustainability, um, and then we're going to in introduce the concepts of how you actually assess or measure sustainability. Um, now, there's several different concepts, but this flows directly into the assignment. Um, that I developed for you. I'll keep the chat bar open, by the way, um, even though many of you know how distracted I can get by it. Um, just in case you have any questions, you know, raise your hand, uh, pop it in the chat bar. First and foremost, as Dr. Michelson said, uh, sustainability in civil engineering has been around for quite some time. Um, so this is from the ASCE policy statement 418. Uh, really the concept as engineers, we're interested in sustainability uh, as it really applies to sustainable development. Right? As engineers and civil engineers, we build things for civil society to actually function with. Things like roads, uh, things like wastewater systems. I guess maybe you can count bridges in there as well. Um, and so we are interested in development. And so from ASCE's perspective, our idea is to look at sustainability through the lens of sustainable development. And that means basically what we're looking at is our, our ways of converting our natural resources into equipment, into facilities, uh, into uh, any sort of engineering uh, facet that we need today without actually compromising the future generation's ability to do so as well. And that's what sustainability boils down to in a nutshell. We want to be able to live the life we can today without also compromising the future's ability to live their life. Um, and if if you don't get much more out of this lecture than that, then definitely get that out of it. That's what we mean by sustainability. Of course, that in itself boils down into uh, multiple different ways of looking at it, right? And so we 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 take sustainability and we boil it down into three really discrete areas. Although, again, I can you know we can have coffee and talk about this another time if you're interested in, in knowing why we actually uh, split the economy out from social, but we do, right? So anytime you're talking about sustainability, it's through what's referred to as the triple bottom line, right? Many of us are used to talking about sustainability, and I don't have a way, yeah, I can write on the screen. Many of you are used to talking about sustainability in uh, terms of the environment, right? Whenever I say sustainability, a lot of you think, okay, well, um, he's talking about greenhouse gas emissions or, or any of that. But no, sustainability, like we said, is about meeting our needs today without compromising the futures of to meet their needs. So that also means economics. For those of you that just got out of my CE 43 class, we looked at cost benefit analysis. We looked at decisions that cost uh, tens of millions of dollars. We looked at how you evaluate trade-offs there. But the idea there is if you're going to invest money in civil infrastructure, 
much of which is constructed using public funds, then the economy has to be a fundamental background to this. And then, of course, social. Um, y'all are going to be civil engineers. Um, and by the way, I love West Virginia, y'all. Y'all are going to be civil engineers. Right? Civil engineers, we build things for society. Right? So we have to look at all three of these. Now, just as kind of a side note, uh, I don't want to say rant of mine, um, I argue that we have to look at it through this lens. I argue that you don't have parts of the economy that are independent of society. You don't have parts of the society that are independent of the natural environment. Um, but that's too nuanced of a discussion to have at this point. Let's get you just understanding what people mean by the triple bottom line. When we look at sustainability, sustainability means that we are somewhere in the middle here. Right? We've considered social, economic, and environmental factors. We've evaluated the trade-off between those, and we've tried to make a decision where we can have our facilities today without compromising our great-great-great-great-grandchildren's ability to do the same. So how do we do that, right? It's a big, big balloon problem. And one of the things that many of my students know, um, and, and I think probably half of you in here have, have heard me ask this question before, but if you haven't, um, how, do you eat an how do you eat an elephant? Um, Elizabeth, how do you eat an elephant? Or do you eat elephants? Sorry if you're a vegetarian. I think we do have one vegetarian in here. I apologize. Yes, thank you, Elizabeth. One bite at a time, right? So, yeah. Uh, so we have at least two vegetarians. Darn, I, my foot's in my mouth uh, squarely. I apologize. Uh, so Elizabeth doesn't eat elephants. I don't eat elephants either. I think they're endangered. Um, all right. It's a big problem. And the idea is that any big problem can only be tackled one bit at a time. And that's uh, whenever I designed homework for this class, Dr. Michelson said, oh, well, don't don't take too much time. You know, uh, you know, I, I actually took quite a bit of time because my objective was for you to be able to look at this large elephant. Uh, I, I'm sorry, let's call it an oversized pumpkin for the vegetarians in the room and know that, yes, it's a huge problem, but you can only eat it one bite at a time. Right. So for me, I like roads and I like asphalt. Um, so I look at things like, how am I increasing the use of recycled materials? I look at things like, OK, can I use uh, my roads as separate drainage systems so that the stormwater has an extra filtration before it reaches the creeks and the streams? I'm actually, uh, next Friday, I'm giving an international webinar on how we can actually look at these two things and how we're doing it across the world. So it gives you an idea that this is something that's happening. Um, we do things like building wildlife crossings. This is something that not a lot of people are familiar with, but it's being done more and more. And if you think about it, um, areas, uh, so India, the country of India is a very, um, they've got a huge issue uh, with human wildlife fatalities. And they're finding that the more and more they put in these wildlife crossings, A, you're saving lives. B, and so that's a social aspect. B, you're saving economics because the fewer people you kill, the cheaper it is. I mean, sorry to put it so blunt, but, um, you know, those, again, in 443, you've seen the cost-benefit analysis associated with that. Um, and C, of course, you're saving the environmental aspects. Uh, animals are needed for the ecosystem. And then, of course, likable and walkable communities, right? So just a few examples of how you can take one bite at a time uh, when we look at sustainability, right? I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, this is where your homework comes in. Um, but the question is, how do we know what's more sustainable? And you just saw Dr. Michelson say, well, when you take steel, you've got a steel manual. Uh, those of you in my 443 class know that whenever you design a highway, you've got the green book, you've got the highway capacity manual, highway safety manual, et cetera. Uh, we have something very similar, uh, whether we are designing a building such as the one we're in right now that is LEEDS uh, certified, whether we're designing a wastewater system right? or whether we're designing highways. And so your homework, uh, you're going to be digging into the invest system a little bit. You're going to be looking at 
how that applies potentially to projects here in the state of West Virginia in a couple cases. Um, and so you'll be able to, to grasp what we mean when we say taking a holistic view. But I want to take a step back, right? Because I've, I've made, you know, allusions to elephants. I've made allusions to giant pumpkins. Um, but what that means and why I call it an elephant or a giant pumpkin uh, or any other sort of very big thing that you look at and you're haunted by is because inherent to this, and the definition we gave earlier is that you've got to think throughout the life cycle of what you're building. You do not ever build a bridge and just let it sit there and never go inspect it, uh, never, I mean, never fix it at some point in its life, right? And so you've got to start thinking throughout the life cycle. Yes, Jeffrey. So as you said, we have to judge everything by the life cycle of a project like a bridge. But when you do the initial project, initial planning, you're making assumptions. But as time progresses, unexpected things happen and life cycle might be cut or extended, one of the two. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good observation. I mean, but Here's, here's the thing, um, and I'm going to take it back because I know that Dr. Michelson's gotten in everybody's head here and, and you all love structural engineering now. So let's take it back to structural engineering. All right, whenever I design a building, um, let's say I design a building in Pennsylvania. I know that I've got, you know, let's say a roof here and it's up in Pennsylvania. I've got some parapets up on my roof. Maybe they're brick. Maybe I've got a sign up here that says, hey, this is a cool building I've designed. Uh, I know that snow is going to build up right, in the wintertime. I know that at some point, well, I don't know this, but maybe at some point they're going to install a new HVAC system right, up here. I've got snow loads that I have to consider. I've got snow drift I have to consider. I've got some dead loads. I've got some live loads. Right? It's the same thing. We as engineers, um, and by the way, this is it's a gorgeous building. Dr. Michelson, don't take it from me. Um, we as engineers, we're trained to actually look at a structure, at a road, and try to evaluate not only what's going to happen right now, what happens under construction loads, for example, for a building, um, but what should I design for in the future, right? I'll design for 20 pounds per square foot of snow load. I'll design for a certain density of snow, et cetera. We're never guaranteed that that's going to happen, right? but we still have to think throughout the life of the project. Um, it's the same thing with highways. Uh, it's why um, I know Brandon in here, for example, took my pavements class last semester and, and or last year, whenever that was, last year, I guess. Um, and he heard me say it. He heard me say that pavements are designed to fail. It's one of the few pieces of civil infrastructure we actually design to fail. Uh, we design it for a controlled failure. But still, we're looking throughout the life cycle of that. So the idea here is you can't have sustainability without looking through the life cycle. That includes um, free. And so where do you get the materials? Where are you getting your aggregates? Where are you getting your cement, your Portland cement, uh, your admixtures you're using? Uh, where are you getting um, the electrical equipment? Right? All of that, how is that being manufactured? And you got to build it. That in itself has a huge impact, both economically, socially, and environmentally. Um, you know, you can think about where you build it or how you build it. Then you use the building, um, right? So we're sitting here in a in a beautiful, nice engineering building that a few years ago uh, left these phases, and now we're here. Right? But life cycle thinking also says, hey, what's going to happen at the end? You know. Um, you know, when we when we stand outside this building and we mourn its loss, um, and and I think well, hopefully I'm dead by that time, but well, that sounds morbid. Hopefully it's long enough in the future that I've had grandchildren and great grandchildren, and then I pass clearly. But then I'll look back up at that window and I'll say, you know, that was a great office I had there. Um, regardless, it's life cycle thinking. It's taking it from the beginning on through. One of my favorite exercises with this is to ask this question. Now, I know everybody in here um, knows what an energy drink is or a soft drink is. I'm actually not an energy drink person. I'm a coffee person. Um, but I know plenty of you are energy drink people because I walk into my lab every morning and I look at the 
trash can and I say, A, they need sleep, and B, you got to learn how to recycle, people. Um, sorry about that, but you do. It's a recycling thing right down the hall. So you go to the store, you buy an energy drink. How can you start to think about the life cycle energy consumption of that can? And I'm not talking the drink here. I'm just talking the can. Right. So let's call this um, just to make my life easier. It's your 7-Eleven. Right. Let's talk about this a little bit. So um, somebody's going to have to unmute their mic or um, uh, or type it in. But name to me something that is contributing to the energy consumption associated with that can that you purchased your energy drink out of. Isaiah, you're always good for giving me answers. What is one source of energy contributing to that can being in that cooler that you grabbed uh, so you could chug your energy drink? Heat, exactly. Manufacturing, exactly. Thank you, Gavin. Right, so we're going to call that, and my handwriting is beautiful on the screen, light, right? So you've got energy sources in here. Did that manufacturing happen in 7-Eleven? No. So what do you have between manufacturing and, and 7-Eleven? Transport. What else is on that can? Right? We're not talking about the drink, but the can itself. It's not just a, a it's not just a shiny piece of metal, is it? Well, you got germs. <laughs> okay. I think we'll put the germs in here in manufacturing. Right? You've got uh, aluminum. Uh, or when I first went through this exercise, it was in England, and so that's aluminum. Um, you've got ink, right? And likely, that ink came from another manufacturing place. Where did that aluminum come from? Any guesses? Pretty sure, I'm pretty sure some of it came from the coal fields metal mill right we're just gonna say uh right because i think there's some metallurgic coal fields down south here um i've never been down there i should go see them sometime right and between all of these of course you've got transport what happens when you drink that you right you walk out again look at me i'm i'm isaiah here I'm on my skateboard. Isaiah, you had a skateboard, right? I remember you showing up to class one time with a skateboard. Yeah, that's what I thought. So I'm on my skateboard. What are you doing with that can? I know if it's Isaiah, he's looking for something that has this symbol on it, right? He's recycling it. There you go, right? So then you can start to see, okay, well, recycling means that can has to go to another facility, right? And then some of that gets put back in here in the aluminum factory. What you've just seen there and kind of, and what you've just helped me walk through is what forms the basis of called life cycle, of something called life cycle assessment. The idea being that whenever I have this pin in my hand, um, this cheap Starbucks water bottle that I refill, um, any of this, it doesn't just show up out of nowhere, right? There are contributions associated with it. There's not only environmental contributions associated with it, right? Because of course, um, you get all the way down here to, I wish I could change my color of my ink easily. Oh, I can. You get all the way down here to CF. Right? We all live here in West Virginia. 
Um, so we've all heard uh, the economics associated with coal fields, whether that's the boom in coal fields, whether that's whenever coal fields fall, right? Some of this, it's all the way up in here uh, to Isaiah. So the idea here is that any material we use, and, and I, I give you this example with a Munster energy drink, but you can associate this with the steel rebar you're using in your, um, in your concrete. You can associate this with the asphalt you're using in your roads. You can associate it with the admixtures that you're putting in in your wastewater treatment facility. Everything that we use has a much bigger scope associated with it. So again, whenever I, I, I start off this lecture and I say it's about meeting our needs now without compromising the future's ability to meet their needs, and then I break it down and I say there's an economic, a social, and environmental context to it. By implication, that means you have to start painting a much bigger picture. That bigger picture we call either life cycle planning or life cycle assessment, if it's in terms of environmental or social aspects. Uh, we call it life cycle cost analysis if we're in, in costing. Right. So let's look at, boil down a little bit more into these. And, right, and again, that, that simple example of your energy drink can hopefully helps you start to understand what we mean when we talk about broader impacts. Start with the easy, easy one, economic impacts. Um, I always talk about this in terms of, of investments in infrastructure. But the fact is, in infrastructure, you have two sides of the coin. Um, somebody tell me, and I said this earlier, so just parrot it back to me, who pays for most of the infrastructure we build around the US? Any guesses? Taxpayers, exactly, Gavin, exactly. Right, and it's not tiny bits of money, right? These are uh, equivalent 2014 uh, dollars. Looking at all public roads, I, okay, let's throw a bone to Dr. Michelson. Let's look at bridges, right? $22.7 billion in investments in public bridges, right? So it is one side of the coin to say that we are taking taxpayer dollars for the most part, right? There's a lot of, of private investment and I don't want to diminish that. Uh, Public-private partnerships are, are you know, a great resource that we have. But for the vast majority of that, we're taking public funds and we're investing it into a very expensive system. The other side of the coin is that use of that system also costs the public a lot of money. Uh, we quoted this number uh, about an hour ago now, $647 per user, right? So in other words, um, and this is from a 2017 showing the effect of, of the poor conditions of West Virginia's roads on vehicle operating costs, right? So the econ and so $647 per user uh, in excess per year, those are the times um, you don't have the problem around here in Huntington, but maybe elsewhere you do, where you you know bust your tire on a pothole or something. Right? You have excess oil use associated with uh, road roughness. So there's two sides of the coin when we start looking at economics. There's who's funding it, and there's how much is it costing the user. And it's a little easier in my field in transportation engineering because the vast majority of what we do is funded by the public. And so those two, the comparison of the public funding versus the public cost is a lot more uh, direct. Of course, when you get into private investments, you can kind of obscure that a little bit. But the, the idea still holds true. If I'm looking at economics, I'm looking at both, um, both sides of the coin. Right, and so I pulled this out of the, uh, the 2015 Conditions and Performance Report. I'm looking at highway revenue. And I just, uh, again, pull this out here to, to reiterate where some of this comes from, right? First things first, motor fuel taxes. Can anybody tell me the last year that the federal gas tax was raised? And let me look through this list real quick. I'll give you a hint. It was before every single one of you, and potentially Dr. Michelson, was born. 
No, I'm, I'm joking. No, I know Dr. Michelson is, is an old man by now. Um, 1993. Uh, can somebody tell me what's happened to uh, miles per gallon, your, your gas fuel efficiency since 1993? Uh, it's gone way up. Right? So already we're starting to see unsustainable economic models associated with how we're funding our infrastructure. That's the economic side. Everyone in this class has taken Engineering 222 and Dr. Waite, if you've taken a Dr. Waite class, I know you know what you're doing, right? And he's taught you everything you need to know about economics. So I don't want to spend too much time on that. But what about social impacts? Um, we build infrastructure. We build infrastructure for society to use. Um, and so we have to be cognizant of what impacts we have socially. Now, again, I'll pull out the low hanging fruit. We live here in West Virginia. Uh, when we moved here, somebody tried to tell me to buy a house in Ohio. And I said, no, I don't want to buy a house in Ohio. I'm a West Virginian. That's that's my goal. I want to go be a West Virginian. Um, and being a West Virginian, we've seen how the impact and changing in industries uh, has affected places like we said, the southern coal fields, right? As a direct relationship of the can that Isaiah bought, and then he skateboarded down and he recycled, that one individual can isn't going to uh, make or break the livelihood of anybody, but it builds up, right? And it's patterns and behaviors. When we look at it in terms of infrastructure, we look at things like what are the effects of um, what I'm purchasing downstream on things like workers. Right. Human rights. That's a big one. So I pulled this. Um, and yes, it's from the EU. So this is spelled correctly. Um, so I pulled this from the UNEP uh, guidelines for social life cycle assessment. I remember what we talked about life cycle assessment being is that holistic view of the product you're using, whether it's the rebar in your steel, whether it's the you know binder you're using in your roadway. What they say for social uh, sustainability is really looking at um, down the line, how are workers affected? Again, you don't have to go very far from here to see how workers are affected. Local communities as a function of that, societies, you know, consumers and various value chain actors, people that have a contribution. Let's say Isaiah stops buying his, his energy drinks. Um, and then everybody else follows suit because Isaiah is a pretty cool guy and they're, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, I want to follow what Isaiah is doing. Um, so everybody stops that. Well, it's not just the aluminum mill. Uh, there you go. Not just the aluminum mill that shuts down. It's the people that drive the aluminum from uh, the coal or the, the, I don't know. You see my ignorance when it comes to how aluminum actually comes out of the ground. I should probably train myself better on that. But it affects the drivers. And then the drivers that take it from the manufacturing plant there. And that has a further downstream effect, right? Again, if we're thinking from a life cycle perspective, those drivers that would then stop in every day at their um, local Tudor's Biscuit World and get one of those really fatty burritos that they sell, um, uh, you know, it affects that Tudor's Biscuit World. So again, it's, it's, it's taking this and looking holistically. Now, your, um, part of your homework, uh, one of the questions in your homework, at least, talks about, okay, well, what does this mean for us in civil engineers? Um, you know, how can we reduce the effect uh, that we have in the construction world um, on local societies? And what does that actually mean? Um, right. And um, don't worry, like I said, you've had me in class before, so you know that I don't give massive homeworks. It's something for you to enjoy. So in, in the federal, sorry, in the federal highway world, um, we start looking at social sustainability as it comes, as it relates to something called livability. Um, livability is the idea that if we're providing uh, roads through communities, to communities, and around communities, those roads shouldn't be a source uh, of of contention, it shouldn't be a source of unhealthiness, it shouldn't be a source uh, that causes, for example, um, stores to move out of your city. 
Um, we have a project that we're doing as a service project here in town, and, and some of you on this call have actually helped me with it in the past. Um, and so it is looking at really rebuilding the, the Bethel Cemetery here in town. Uh, and it's an old abandoned cemetery. It's an old abandoned African-American cemetery. And the history of that actually dates back to I-64 being built. Uh, and then there's a lot more in terms of that, um, you know, that we won't get into today, but you can take my class on it next semester and we'll get into it there. But fundamentally, when I-64 was, was placed there, um, there was a bout with eminent domain. And effectively, as a result of that and several other actions, the cemetery uh, became abandoned. There was nobody to take care of it. There was nobody responsible for it. It became private land. Nobody could go in on it, right? That is one way we affect livability by designing a highway. One thing that we do with sustainability now is trying to say, how do we mitigate that from happening? How do we stop that from happening in the future? Um, at kind of a more broad scale, things like multimodal facilities. Um, many of you in this class know that I walk back and forth to campus most days. Um, I, it's something I enjoy doing. Um, but it's also a way for me to try to promote walking uh, and something that I actually believe in, which is multimodality. Uh, it actually gives me a chance whenever I talk to the city of Huntington's planning director uh, and say, Bree, how are we going to get this multimodality figured out more? All right, so, you know, providing safe and adequate accommodations. Um, those are all considerations uh, for social sustainability. Um, and then the low-hanging fruit here is, is environmental impacts. And I say it's low-hanging fruit because it's something that is all over the news. Um, you've all taken or will take at least environmental engineering. Uh, you've all seen some environmental impacts, whether you uh, know it or not, whether it's large algae blooms that happen out in the Ohio River, uh, whether it is, uh, you know, having water that you can't drink, whether it's having air that's that's insanely polluted. Um, so how do we look at environmental impacts? Well, first and foremost, we do an LCA. We do the same thing we did for the can, only we try to track and it's, it's really an accounting thing. We try to track the pollutants uh, and energy consumption associated with each step in the process all the way through the future. The idea of understanding really the inputs and the outputs, the, the, the pollutants that go into making something, the energy consumption that goes into making something, and the pollutants that come out of it. So usually when we look at civil infrastructure, um, we look at really five phases, and we talked about these five phases with Isaiah's uh, energy drink earlier. Right, you've got some production of raw materials, you've got some manufacturing or construction, you've got some use, you've got maintenance, or in the cans, I guess, that's whenever you, um, you know, toss it in the recycling bin, and that feeds into end of life. Um, I say here, maybe I should have put this earlier, the boundaries are critical. What I mean there is life cycle thinking is there, but how far do you draw your boundaries? Right. So in, in Isaiah's aluminum can, for example, uh, what about the fact that there had to be an aluminum manufacturing facility um, built? There's some energy consumption associated with that. Or you had to build the trucks to carry the cans. So do you put those inside or outside the boundaries? Do you count the environmental effects associated with those or not? Um, and that is something that a lot of, of researchers, so, you know, the people that, well, people like me that work at universities and you say, well, Dr. Bryce teaches two classes. What does he do with the rest of his time? It's kind of what we do with the rest of our time. Right? We conduct studies and we evaluate where should those boundaries be drawn and what's the effect of drawing those boundaries. So, beautiful, right? Uh, part of your homework is memorizing this. Um, I will fully expect for you to be able to quote it back. To, I'm joking. Um, but here's how we look at the environmental effects associated with, with processes. And I bring this here um, because I want you to understand why we look at the environmental effects. 
The entire goal, as I've said from the beginning, is for us as a society to be able to meet our needs now without compromising the future society's or future's ability to meet their needs. And so that means even when we look at environmental considerations, we bring it down to a few considerations. Human health, your ecosystem, right? Don't kill the polar bears, don't kill the koala bears, right? Resources. You use all the aggregate now, say you're in California and you're basically out of aggregate, um, then of course people in the future can't meet their needs if they need aggregate, right? And that's one of the fundamental goals behind a lot of researchers now in environmental life cycle assessment. How do you link all of these, you know, acidification, ozone formation, eutrophication, ecotoxicity into something that we can digest to say, how is this affecting human health? How is this affecting the ecosystem? And how is this affecting, you know, resources, uh, whether that's biotic resources or abiotic resources? All right. Now, um, we're going back to Charlie Brown's pumpkin, right? And you're looking at that pumpkin, and the only way to eat it is one bite at a time. How do we do it? Well, I just showed you a big picture. What I want you to know is that not one single engineer, unless you are an uber nerd like me who sits up at night reading reports on this stuff, uh, and I still can't do it, not one single engineer can tell you everything associated uh, <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Michelson, that pun. I knew I shouldn't have had the comment bar open. Um, all right. How do we measure it? We take uh, the elephant or the pumpkin oops, and we boil it down. What we do is we take the problem and we say, here's a bite you can take, and here's a bite you can take, and here's a bite you can take. Or if it's you know, multiple bites, here's how you can break out that bite. So you can actually take it and digest it. We also recognize that in civil engineering, one reason I love civil engineering is that it takes every single discipline. Uh, Dr. Michelson said earlier, um, which by the way, he was a few days late announcing it. I announced it to you all a couple days ago. So I, uh, you know, I got my time timing down, uh, but he said Toyota, is hiring environmental engineers. I remember in my 443 class when I made the announcement, everybody said, why in the heck would Toyota need environmental engineers? Right, and I gave answers back then, but the, the fundamental idea is in engineering, especially in civil engineering or engineering associated with civil society, you have to have every type of engineer. And so you take Charlie Brown's pumpkin and you start dividing it out and you say, okay, these the highway engineers can figure out this. The bridge engineers can figure out that. And then you take those and you start cutting them down. Right. And that's, again, that's the job of, of people like me, researchers like me, uh, where I spent my postdoc saying, okay, well, how do we, you know, cut the, divide the pumpkin out for, for roads? Usually the way it is done is through a point based system. Uh, this is what your homework is on. You're going to look at the Federal Highway Invest System and you're going to say, okay, well, how do I promote sustainability on specific types of projects uh, through assessing points through categories? Uh, you can also have quantitative approaches. Those are far, further, uh, fewer and far between. And you can see the challenges associated there with, um, you know, how do I actually quantify some of these environmental effects? Yes, I know that there's social cost of carbon, et cetera. Um, but really, is that truly quantifying the effects? Um, most often, these are not mandated. Um, absolutely, environmental engineers are needed for the emerging electronic vehicle production. One side of the coin for that. So, sorry, I'm answering Brandon's question. He said, would environmental engineers be needed for emerging electronic vehicle production? Yes, you've got your large batteries, which could have a huge environmental impact. Uh, you've got your large manufacturing facilities, right, which always have environmental engineers on hand uh, to help mitigate simple things like runoff from their site, um, but also to potentially solve bigger problems. So yes, absolutely. Uh, good question. Thanks, Brandon. I miss having you in class this semester, by the way. All right. 
let's let's finish this up so you all have something to take home with you. Let's talk about what sustainability assessment does and does not. Sustainability assessment is a decision support tool. It helps you understand what the impact of your potential decisions are. That way you can start looking from a different perspective at different alternatives. What it doesn't do, it doesn't tell you you have to build something new. It's not a trigger, right? Uh, and if you want to know what a good, good example of a trigger is, a bridge falling down is a good trigger that you need to build a new bridge. Right? Sustainability assessment isn't that. It's not something that says, hey, you need to go out and reconstruct this. It doesn't dictate what you shouldn't do. It only helps promote what you should do. Right? And basically, it's best practice to try to help you reduce uh, environmental impacts. One example is green roads. Um, green roads was developed back uh, Washington State with the idea being that they have a set of, I can barely see this. Anyways, let's make it bigger next time. There's a set of, of activities where you can go through and you can say, okay, I'm going to build a road. Uh, which What should I look at? Okay, I've got drainage. Maybe I should start considering bioswells. What's the advantage of having a bioswell there versus having a porous pavement? Right. And so it takes and it builds these points up. And then at the end, you get green roads certified, whether you're platinum, whether you're gold. Um, I can't remember. Evergreen is their best one. That's what it is. Other examples. Lead. Uh, we have an engineering building that is lead. Um, Dr. Michelson, help me out. Is it platinum? Um, I should know. Uh, gold. OK, we're lead gold. Uh, you have to, not to interrupt. It started out at silver, but they they um, tweaked some of the uh, HVAC and it got gold certification. I think it was two years ago, something like that. Oh, excellent. No, that's that's excellent. And that tells you, I mean, thank you, Dr. Michelson, because that's a great example of some of the considerations. Right. He said they tweaked um, the HVAC system and it made it more sustainable or gave it more points towards sustainability. Again, if you can have a more efficient system where you can reduce your energy consumption, you can reduce, um, you know, environmental pollutants that contributes to sustainability. Um, I'm going to wrap up here with just talking about the framework and how these are built. Really, the idea is you take a list of best practices that contribute towards your environmental, economic and social sustainability. You try to figure out which have the most impact. And you give those with the most impact higher scores. You give those with the least impact the lowest score. And then you make some sort of system to where you say, OK, well, if you make 80 points, then you are silver. If you make 100 points, then you are gold. Right. So you take a bunch of activities with object that meet objectives. And you set them towards targets. A couple, you know, really the last thing that I want to say is, is said down here. Um, your points, really, it's the idea of being able to quantify things you can't quantify. I love West Virginia because it's beautiful, but I can't quantify that. I can assign points to it. And as an engineer, what you do is more about how you get there in sustainability than it is what your final score is. And that's how all these systems are set up. Um, there are drawbacks. I'm going to let you read those. Um, but we are at 1249. Um, any questions uh, before I hand it back over to Dr. Michelson? Everyone in here knows I like to talk. So if you have questions, just let me know. <laughs> All right. I'll know I like my puns. I know I did notice that your time in Great Britain leaked out. You said you had a couple aluminiums. Yes. Yes, aluminium and program ending with an E. Oh yeah. <laughs> Gotta keep those. I do appreciate you. Any questions me. for Dr. Bryce? Quick before we call it. <laughs> My, mine too. It's okay. <laughs> yep. Same here. 
All right, I appreciate it, Jonathan. Thank you. Well, I appreciate everyone having right. me today. Thank you. All right, your uh, your homework will be uh, live here in a few minutes, uh, and that's all we have, everybody. I'm going to stop the recording. We'll see you all next week. All right, take care. Stay safe, stay healthy. We'll see you then.